Welcome everyone to today's webinar, a non-opioid, non-NSAID analgesic for perioperative pain management. I'm Mackenzie Bean with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenter. Dr. Jaled Saleh is a board-certified pharmacotherapy and critical care specialist with over 15 years of clinical experience. He is the manager of clinical services and critical care coordinator at the Hospital for Special Surgery. Dr. Soleil created and implemented HSS's first pharmacy clinical program, sits on the hospital's opioid task force, and co-chairs its pharmacy and antimicrobial stewardship committees. He also serves as an affiliate professor of pharmacy at St. John's University. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Dr. Soleil to begin today's pre presentation. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm in New York City, so um, we've been going through some rough times right now, but things have uh, slowed down to some degree. Uh, so hopefully I can get through this slide deck and get this message across um, in regards to pain management and what medications um, that you need to utilize. Uh, so this is Perspectives in Pain Management for Pharmacists, uh, implementing a non and said non-opioid approach, but technically it's not just for pharmacists, it's for anyone, um, it could be beneficial to anyone listening. So just to get through this real quick to start, we're going to talk about some of the challenges in shifting healthcare landscape. So uh, this is a the United States of America, and as I'm sure it's not surprising to uh, everyone listening that we're going through an opioid uh, epidemic. Um, and this has been going on for years and years on in, and the drug overdose for death has been increasing. Um, so some of the challenges have been to try to minimize opioid usage and uh, hopefully uh, minimize addiction. Uh, and as you can see, this was in, uh, done in 2017, uh, and, and the numbers have been increasing. But as you can see, this is done by death rates per 100,000 per population. And on the right-hand side, under range category, uh, it's per 100,000. So these numbers are real. Uh, it, it is a serious issue, and most of our institutions, no matter what type of patient population you treat or handle, are dealing with some sort of um, opioid usage and, and trying to minimize. Uh, so the CDC reported about 70,237 people have died from drug overdoses in uh, 2017, with 68% involved in opioid. Those are pretty high numbers, and the numbers keep climbing if we don't tackle this. Uh, so what are some challenges that are facing the hospital environment, right? So um, healthcare challenges, improving access has always been an issue, reducing cost and improving quality. And we're going to get into quality a little more uh, in the next few slides. Reducing cost, we've all, I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. Everyone tries to reduce cost uh, without affecting uh, patient care. Uh, some hospital challenges, reimbursement reduction from all payers, that's always been a challenge, uh, whether it's a surgical procedure or uh, a hospital visit in general, and combating some of these reimbursements has been an issue, uh, trying to maximize uh, patient care. Uh, transitioning from volume-based to value-based care, which is something we can also talk about. Uh, it used to be about uh, how many cases you could do or how many patients you can see, and now it's more about uh, th there's economics behind um, how uh, value-based care can um, increase reimbursements. Aging population. You know, I work at the Hospital for Special Surgery, and we do a ton of orthopedic uh, surgical procedures of all types. And what I did notice 
is uh, years ago when I was a student here, um, you know, we, we had some limitations based on age and a, A1C and things of that nature, and now we're taking on older patients who still have a chance to have a great quality of life, uh, more complicated patients, and taking those on, and that's been something I think that's been going on uh, across the country as well. Uh, drug shortages, we're all dealing with this, especially now with this crisis going on. Um, drug shortages have always been an issue. Challenging what medications to give as a substitute has always been a, a challenge. Uh, uh, educating staff on the new drugs and making sure that it's given efficiently and effectively and safely. Uh, An increased use of biologics, that's been something going on, especially in the, um, uh, the rheumatological world. So an evolving paradigm for achieving long-term value. So we've discussed value and the importance of value. Uh, so increasing quality and increasing patient satisfaction while decreasing costs. So we all, again, try to decrease incremental costs uh, as much as we can, uh, whether it's overtime, whether it's cost of merchandise, uh, things of that nature. But cost effectiveness or even cost minimization would be between drugs, uh, bringing them to P&T committee. But as you could see, how, how do you increase quality? and increase patient satisfaction, and why is that such a big deal with value? So what's the role of a pharmacist when it comes to quality? Um, and, and I'm a pharmacist, but it doesn't just have to be a pharmacist, but where do we kind of uh, play a large role? Um, so one big issue here, I mean, we always play important advocacy role for therapeutic choices, and as you can see, we are the ones that kind of police medications and police um, which uh, medications are optimal and how to switch them off possibly to something even cheaper to improve outcomes uh, tied with reimbursement. We share our expertise. Um, we're part of multidisciplinary teams. A big part of that is rounding, uh, getting involved, and sometimes getting your message across during rounds. It could take a few sentences and some, some literature could go a very long way to steering a big part of your institution to supporting uh, um, uh, a specific medication therapy. Recognizing and communicating the value, uh, that's important uh, from an institutional level, uh, even from an administrative level, and understanding that there is reimbursement coming from different places um, as a result of your medication therapy, so that's really important. And seeking ongoing opportunities, so, you know, whether it's a DUE or whether you're bringing things to the P&T committee or whatever committee you're on to increase quality and help with patient safety. So why is quality so important, and is there a dollar amount that's tied to quality? So we want the best quality for our patients, but, you know, it's not – it used to be just wanting the best quality, and now what they're doing is tying a dollar sign to it. Uh, with Medicare, 6% of Medicare revenue is at risk. Uh, and what does that mean? That means that value-based purchasing, and if the, for those that don't know what it is, it's, it's metrics – that are put in place that you'd have to hit, uh, and we're not going to go into all the different metrics, whether it's infection rate, readmission for PE, DBT, things of that nature. A metrics, you you know, all these different metrics that we'd want to satisfy um, in order to get that six percent that's being withheld by uh, Medicare, and uh, the six percent is usually part of a required programs, which are hospital re the hospital readmissions reduction program, hospital acquired condition reduction program, hospital value based purchasing program. So that's where your six percent comes in, and those are required programs from CMS. So um, they can withhold six percent if you don't meet those metrics. Now, there's other voluntary programs, as you could see on your right, and um, that's uh, in addition uh, that can be included to the uh, required programs. Now, what is CMS's bundled payment initiative? Um, it's the CJR, or Comprehensive Care uh, for Joint Replacement, and coming from Orthopedic Surgery Hospital, we understand this very well. It's an initiative by CMS um, basically giving you a bundle payment where everything is included. Uh, and in other words, for me, it's basically putting your money where your mouth is. So if I would, an example, if I were to negotiate, uh, let's say, $40,000 for a specific surgery, um, we're getting that 40000 It's all part of a bundle payment. So if the patient 
happens to be in our hospital for two weeks due to complications, we're not getting any more money. It's the 40000 It's the 40000 whether it costs us 100000 to have them here for 10 days to two weeks. Um, with that being said, if they're discharged in one day um, and you do it efficiently because it's not just the discharge but the bundle payment and quality measures is for a 90-day um, period, especially for the lower extremity, such as hips and knees. So, yeah, you're discharge, discharging them quicker. It gets you and your team to start working more efficiently. Uh, you get to recoup that uh, reimbursement. Uh, and then on top of that, if the patient gets discharged and then within those 90 days gets readmitted, you have to eat that cost. So that's another way um, to see how important value is um, to this program. Now, even under the CJR, we talked about the 6% that Medicare holds back, the, voluntary, the um, uh, required programs. Even with their CJR program, 3% is still withheld. Now, you may say, well, 3% is not much. It's millions and millions of dollars. That's withheld if you don't have positive scores or meet those metrics uh, that are part of uh, the quality performance uh, and value-based purchasing programs. So 50% of this 3% is due to post-surgical complications when it comes to that score. Um, Forty percent is HCAP scores, and ten percent is patient-reported outcome data. So now you might be thinking, why are uh, HCAP scores? Why have they been so popular lately? In the past few years, uh, and of course we want our patients' experiences to be amazing, um, there is money involved in this because almost half of this 3% that's tied to the CJR that's due to uh, quality performance comes from these HCAP scores. And as you can see on the bottom, it goes from if you, uh, your quality scores were excellent based on the different CJR tiers, um, you're eligible for reconciliation of 1.5% adjustment uh, to your discount factor. Good is a 1% adjustment. Acceptable, there's no adjustment. And below acceptable, uh, you actually might get hit. So it's just something to think about and consider in this. Um, and that's where HCAP scores and patient satisfaction becomes a really big deal. And you're wondering, why am I mentioning value and reimbursement when it comes to pain management? And we're going to get into that, but the, the truth is uh, the HCAP scores, there's a ton of pain questions involved. Well, a few pain questions, but a lot of uh, questions are tied into pain management and patient satisfaction. Um, patients being discharged early, uh, rehab quicker, have to do with pain management as well. That's a big factor to it. So that all ties into reimbursement and increasing your reimbursement. So the CGR, so what did they say? CMS said, you know what, for CJRs, the, the joint replacement bundle, uh, we're going to check a one-year evaluation to see if it affected patient care. So the average Medicare payments for hip and knee joint replacements were 3.3% lower for CJR episodes compared with control episodes. So with that being said, not only we're going to go into if it was efficient right under it, uh, savings were due to relative reductions in payments, skilled nursing, and then quality of care was the same. So the quality of care was the same when they ran their report, but Medicare had lower CJR episodes uh, and saved a lot of money. So not only did Medicare save a lot of money, your institution made money and the quality of care was, was the same. And this initiative is still ongoing. So that's where we are with value-based purchasing. Uh, that's where we are with um, CJRs and money being withheld by CMS and how HCAPS plays a big part in those scores and how pain plays a big part of HCAP scores and plays a big part of uh, hospital um, discharges. So acute pain management overview. If your institution is doing this, uh, I feel really bad because this is um, – the way you would treat pain in the days of the dinosaurs. And if they are stewing, doing this, or you have a team of physicians doing this, or you have one specific physician doing this, I really would, um, you know, I would really hope that you would speak to them or try to get the point across because treating mild, moderate, and severe pain all with opioids is, is poor pain management therapy. So what were some drivers for change based on the old paradigm we just looked at? The joint com These are some big guns. The Joint Commission, CMS, and ISMP um, all throughout the years in chronological order 
uh, came out with statements and, and, and projects in regards to pain. So uh, Joint Commission 2012 issued Sentinel Event Alert addressing safe use of opioids. 2015 uh, issued a Sentinel Event Alert aimed at preventing falls in healthcare facilities with medications included as contributing risk factor, which were opioids. Um, in 2018, began implementation of a new pain management standards. Uh, CMS 2014 issued a memo about patient risk assessment and appropriate monitoring for uh, opioid administration. And in 2017, they published the opioid misuse strategy, which was uh, pretty impactful. 2018, they changed their focus on HCAP pain questions from pain management to communication about pain. And recently, they've removed the questions on the HCAP scores in, in regards to pain because people overshot uh, pain management and gave opioids in order to get good scores with pain in order to have uh, better satisfaction and reimbursement. So that those questions were, were changed uh, and modified, and the uh, new questions should be out soon, if not out already. Uh, ISMP uh, in 2017 noted opioids as one of the two classes of drugs most frequently linked to medication errors in 2017, accounting for 8% of hospital reported medication errors. So, on top of them being an issue with addiction, over sedation, adverse drug effects, and patient satisfaction, it's also causing um, medication errors. So understanding multimodal analgesia, multimodal analgesia just means pull out different weapons that work differently so that you can minimize um, opioids and, and, and help with pain management. And what do we use centrally? There's, they're the opioids. And let me tell you, opioids can be used efficiently when needed. Uh, it doesn't mean you completely eradicate them for someone who has a pain that's 10 out of 10. Um, alpha-2 agonists, what are those? Clonidine and dextro, uh, dext dextatomid dexmetomidine, which is uh, Presidex. Really cool medications. Uh, Presidex is a lot more selective than clonidine, and that helps with sedation as well, as, as well as being a weak analgesic. Acetaminophen, extremely safe for the most part, relatively safe, uh, good as an antipyretic and for pain. NMDA antagonists, what are those? Uh, one of the, the big one I'll talk about is ketamine, which is coming back in favor, uh, which helps minimize some opioids. Uh, really good if you have uh, hypotension or cardiovascular issues, uh, um, and um, it's uh, it's non-sedating for the most part, but you'd have to worry about. Um, some psychotropic effects and using benzos with that at some point and idiocratic uh, diuresis. Gabapentinoids, uh, great for neuropathic pain. Those are used as well. Uh, you know, if you're looking locally, most people don't talk about local anesthetics except for anesthesia, but they're gems if done correctly and can help um, anesthetize the joint or the, wherever you're giving it correctly uh, to minimize opioid use. NSAIDs and COX-2 inhibitors uh, could be used, uh, great for anti-inflammatory effects. Some issues, though, when it comes to renal insufficiency of your thrombocytopenic or you're bleeding out um, can cause some AKI at times, depending on your um, fluid status or what type of surgery you're having or in general, but or the elderly. So, you know, when talking about these medications, we're not talking about 50,000 meds and complicated. You're talking about a handful of meds to treat pain that are non opioids, and how do we maximize that? So, how would you treat this paradigm here, the new paradigm, which is the multimodal analgesia approach that we just discussed? You start with a non opioid, such as acetaminophen NSAIDs, maybe a COX 2, such as Celebrex or Meloxicam, and local anesthetic infiltration, such as bupivacaine, ropivacaine. Um, and using that as for mild pain. And then for moderate pain, if that doesn't work, adding intermittent doses of opioid, maybe like a diluted 0.5 push or whatever you think is best for that patient as needed. And then if it's severe pain and you've, you've exhausted step one and two, um, you can uh, add a local anesthetic peripheral neuro, uh, neuro blockade, uh, maybe like an epidural um, and sustained release opioids uh, to kind of monitor the use of uh, as needed if they keep increasing. So multimodal analgesia, is this something new? Is it endorsed? Look around. These are all the societies uh, that endorse this. And the American Society of Anal uh, Anesthesiologists, uh, Society of Critical Care of Medicine, uh, the ERAS uh, Society, 
uh, and the list goes on and on. So this is something that is endorsed. It's not something I'm just making up. What's next in the paradigm management? Uh, could we actually go opioid-free? Is that even possible? Uh, you know, some people think so. That's the goal one day, hopefully. Uh, but further research is needed to see if we can go without using opioids at all. So who's exploring this opioid-free uh, pain management regimen? Um, 2019 Joint Consensus Statement on Perioperative Opioid Minimization Opioid-Naive Patients, specifically opioid-naive patients, and um, the American Society for Enhanced Recovery and the Perioperative Quality Initiative both came out with statements concluded, concluding that opioid-free anesthesia and analgesia are feasible options while recognizing the need for further research. So they do want to analyze risk and benefits. They think this can happen, it, you know, uh, and they also feel, especially with opioid-naive patients, and they feel that surgical patients, uh, since they have an estimated of approximately 6% rate of new persistent postoperative opioid use, so that's a large number when you're talking about millions of people um, that have new and persistent postoperative opioid use. So that's something to think about in the future, and hopefully it's something we can um, maybe get to one day with uh, some newer medications coming out and, and maximizing multimodal analgesia. So where does Affirmative play a part in this? Uh, Affirmative is IV acetaminophen, uh, and um, we use it in my facility. It's a formulary medication here, and we've maximized it to try to minimize opioids and uh, help with multimodal approach, with the multimodal approach. So it's, uh, it's firm of, is acetaminophen, it's an injection it's indicated for the management of mild to moderate pain in adult and pediatric patients two years and older. The management of moderate to severe with adjunct, adjunctive opioid analgesics in adult and pediatric patients two years and older, and the reduction of fever in adults and pediatric patients. So keep in mind, it's indicated for two years and older, um, and for mild to moderate, it could possibly be used alone, and they're saying if you go up higher, you can use it as an adjunct with um, some of the opioids. What do we really worry about with this, honestly, in my experience, is, is liver. So you don't really, I wouldn't say worry if you stay under the four gram mark. Um, some warnings, you know, just stay under the four grams. Uh, if, the, if they're under 50 kilos, which is most pediatric patients or frail older patients or just someone who's super thin, we like to do weight-based dosing. Um, and, it, and it's easier to do, and you may have to use a syringe pump. Uh, we do that if they're under 50 or below. We, use a, we put it in a syringe, not a bag. And we prime a syringe pump and have them use a syringe pump when giving it to be very accurate. Uh, with that being said, um, it, it, just make sure uh, that, you know, uh, be cautious if their creatinine clearance is under 30. Uh, and um, make sure that when you're dosing, you're not dosing, um, you're dosing in milligrams and not in mLs as it's 10 milligrams per mL when it comes in package. So, how do we know this works? Uh, if it, when it gets into your system, you have to have a Cmax, which is your, your plasma level. So your mean plasma concentration has to hit about 10 to 15 for, for this drug to get to your CSF. Once it gets to your CSF, it's efficacious. So it's dosed every four to six hours. We dose it every six hours here. Um, so what do we do? Uh, how do we know it actually gets to your bloodstream? Um, it's got to get to your bloodstream in, in order for it to get to your CSF. And as you can see, in surgical settings, your absorption of oral analgesics is very compromised. Uh, the surgical procedure and, uh, you know, your fasting, your stress, your catecholamine release, uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, um, shuts down your GI tract, leads to some post-op constipation, possibly ileus at times. Your anesthetics that are being used in anesthesia and opioids are contributing factors to doing this. So this makes you think, how could, you know, theoretically, how could you take something orally if, it's, if your GI tract is basically at a standstill? So... We talked about plasma and CSF, and what does this show us here? This was a randomized three-way crossover design, and what they did was purely on pharmacokinetics. They said, you know, we're going to see if acetaminophen given IVPO or rectal makes a difference in getting to your bloodstream. And as, and as you can see with the red, which is the IV, it hit a mean plasma concentration of over 20 
uh, immediately within minutes. And um, the gray was the oral, and the light gray on the bottom was the parectum. And uh, you know, the IV route was 76 higher. Um, in mean plasma concentration than PO and 256% higher than mean plasma. And what is this just showing us? It's just showing us basic pharmacokinetics. And um, now we'd like to see if this mean plasma concentration spikes this way and this curve and area under the curve, uh, it, it, it shows that this is how it performs. Does it go into the CSF the same way? So this is the CSF chart. And as you could see, the area under the curve changes. It actually it coincides with the mean plasma concentration. If you could see the red, the IV, um, the area under the curve is way higher than the PO and the parectum. Um, and when you're comparing the CSF values, the IV group was 60% higher than PO and 87% higher than parectum, which means this is where a lot of the effect occurs. Um, although the clinical benefit of reduced opioid consumption it really wasn't evaluated, demonstrated in this in this data. So now they threw. They said, you know, we're going to throw in some IV morphine, and we're going to see. We're going to utilize PO and IV, and every six hours we're going to give IV morphine 0.125 um, milligrams per kilo in a 15-minute infusion, and see if adding an opioid actually affects any of the pharmacokinetics. Um, and, and possibly some pharmacodynamics in this chart. Um, so, uh, you know, group A had four repeat doses of one gram PO acetaminophen plus IV placebo at hours 0, 6, 12, and 18, as you can see. And group B got four repeated doses of uh, 1,000 milligrams of IV acetaminophen plus uh, a placebo tablet at hours 0, 6, 12, and 18. But both groups received two doses of IV morphine at hours 6 and 12. Um, so let's see what happened with that. So now, as you look at how did the PO react? So the gray peaks are the PO um, mean plasma concentrations. And as you could see, that the gray peaks are when you didn't have IV morphine involved. Um, as you could see, the uh, morphine was given at 6 and 12 hours, and you can see those peaks drop. And remember, you need a peak, mean peak plasma concentration of 15 or, you know, to kind of get into the CSF between 10 and 15. And if it's going to go below or at 5 or below, um, you might be in trouble with getting some effect. Um, so it does show that giving morphine in, in here, which is slows GI motility and can cause constipation, might have affected the PO absorption. Uh, at hour 18 to 21, you see that big peak. That's because we stopped the morphine, and it was almost, uh, we're thinking, a dump effect of the Tylenol just dumping back into your system and taking you up to that peak level. Um, I've uh, witnessed that at, at, um, in my hospital and checking labs. We've got some, you know, the ALTs, ALTs. STs went up a little bit, nothing detrimental, but just something to monitor for uh, the dump effect. How did the IV do? Um, it's going straight into your bloodstream. There's no first pass metabolism. The peaks are, there's no variability. Um, the morphine did not affect its absorption, obviously, because it's an IV. Um, so that's, uh, that's some benefit to see here when you see in comparison, you know, giving the morphine with and without uh, or giving it with PO or giving it with IV acetaminophen. So it's, it's important to see this so, because you need to know the basics of pharmacokinetics between PO and IV and, and how this makes uh, perfect sense when um, treating a patient, uh, especially if their GI tract could be compromised by surgical procedure, fasting, uh, analgesia, um, things of that nature. So one of the pilot studies uh, for IV acetaminophen was in major orthopedic surgery, and the primary endpoint of the study was basically pain relief measured at a five-point uh, verbal scale over six hours. Uh, it was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, single and repeated dose, 24-hour study. There was about 101 people in the study, uh, recipients in the study, and the patients received one gram with uh, patient-controlled analgesia, which is PS PCA, as most of you know, morphine, or placebo with PCA in the morning following total hip or knee replacement. So the whole point here is to say, you know what, now that we know the pharmacokinetics, we're going to trial this against placebo to see even if this even works. And to see they're all on IV PCA morphine, are they going to press the button more for rescue? Are they going to feel pain relief based on that five-point verbal scale? Um, 
and the results are um, pretty clear. Uh, if you look at that chart on the right, the median time to use of rescue, it took IV acetaminophen three hours longer to, to require rescue than placebo, which was 0.8. Uh, morphine consumption, the morphine equivalent was 33% less uh, when giving IV acetaminophen, and the safety was very comparable to um, placebo. So just something to consider. I know this is versus placebo. It might not feel that exciting, but again, we have to prove that this even work. First, we went into pharmacokinetics, and now we're trialing it against placebo to see if it even works. What about uh, hepatic safety data? For Fermev, a lot of people are like, well, you know, I don't want to give it to someone. I'm afraid that it might cause transaminitis of some sort or hepatotoxicity of some sort. Uh, they gathered all the data here um, from from uh, uh, the database, and it was pooled all from uh, all these different studies. Uh, and basically, what it showed is if that you had stable ALT and AST values at baseline, that a firmav was extremely comparable to placebo when it came to any increases or transaminitis to um, acetaminophen. IV acetaminophen. So this is basically showing us if your liver function is fine and you stay within the 4 gram max dose or the mg per kg for anyone under 50 kilos that it's really not going to affect your liver function. Now if you have a stable um, chronic, a stable, uh, a chronic stable hepatic issue um, We've given a firm in, in that situation as well. Our, our fear usually is if in an acute event or an event where the uh, hepatotoxicity is extreme. So how do you give this? We give it in a bag, uh, or you know, or you know, one gram uh, for most of our patients, unless they're under 50 kilos. We like to give. Uh, we, you want to make sure, if from a safety perspective, uh, the number one hurdle is uh, making sure that uh, they don't exceed four grams based on other products that you're giving that do have acetaminophen. We steered away from Percocets and Vicodins and stuck with um, uh, oxycodone plain in order to cut down acetaminophen uh, usage uh, or toxicity. We have MARs for nurses that seem to um, calculate a 24-hour acetaminophen uh, usage and it'll alert them not to sign off to go talk to a prescriber if they've exceeded four grams. So these are some things that you should work on in your institution to try to bypass that hurdle. Um, are there any guidelines that say to, to specifically use IV acetaminophen? Um, yeah, so these are two guidelines. One is uh, from a powerful society, right, which is the SCCM, Critical Care Medicine, uh, and the American College of Critical Care Medicine, uh, ACCM. And what they say is the use of acetaminophen by all routes, including IV for opioid sparing analgesia in adult critically ill patients, IV may be preferable in some subgroups due to reduced absorption of oral and rectal formulations. So it, it's good to see that there's societies that actually support this in, these, in this environment. The ERAS Cardiac Society, uh, or ERAS Society of 2019, use of acetaminophen postoperatively for pain management states it may be the safest non-opioid analgesic. Uh, notes IV may be better absorbed until gut function recovers postoperatively, recommends discontinuation of opioid and acetaminophen, acetaminophen combination products. So these two organizations definitely support the use in specific subgroups when um, IV uh, acetaminophen could be used. What about just uh, acetaminophen, not really indicating the route. These are the three societies and organizations, uh, the American College of Surgeons, uh, American Co uh, Society of uh, An uh, Anesthesiologists Task Force on Acute Pain Management, Enhanced Recovery After Surgery, the ERA Society, all uh, endorse using acetaminophen as part of your multimodal analgesia strategy to, to minimize opioids. So acetaminophen is already a big deal. Um, it's, a, it, it's amazing to use. Uh, it's relatively safe in, in, multi, in the multimodal analgesia approach. But there's uh, IV seems to be extremely beneficial in certain uh, subgroups or populations, um, and we're going to get into that. So if you have a patient in the preoperative, intraoperative, or postoperative setting, 
And is NPO, which most of these patients are, or not able to tolerate oral medication, how do you manage the, pain's, uh, the patient's pain and minimize opioid use? Um, there's not many guns out there, guys. You're either going to give an opioid or you're going to give um, Ketorolac um, or you're going to give some of these uh, newer NSAIDs that probably came out that are super expensive also. Um, but again, what are you giving? Um, you don't have much unless you want to use an opioid. Um, so when you talk about injectable pain medications, non-opioid injectables, uh, you're very limited. So it's good to hear what others would do in these situations. And what we've been doing is maximizing IV acetaminophen because they are NPO and because they are not tolerating oral medication at the time through the whole intra-op, pre-op, and post-operative process. And a lot of times, um, you know, we do it and um, it, for the most part give it Q6 times four doses and reevaluate after. So moving the way forward, where are we headed with this? Um, this is probably one of my favorite slides. So, you know, pharmacy or any other department we're facing many challenges in the current hospital environment. So what are we facing? There's a huge disconnect, obviously, between our budget in the pharmacy and any reimbursement increases that are applied to the hospital. So you can apply a pain or any sort of medication regimen or anything that helps patient satisfaction, discharge times, uh, rehabilitation, uh, you know, you can, patient satisfaction, you can implement something that could indirectly cause a, a big, uh, you know, reimbursement flow for your institution and increase dollar signs, uh, but no one will ever know, and there's a big disconnect. So you're doing the right thing, but at the end of the day, you're being punished for spending $600,000 on a regimen that might have returned a few million dollars to the institution. Um, so pharmacy practices may be creating savings that are reflected in overall hospital reversion, but it's not in the pharmacy budget. You might even lose your job for doing it, but it's helping the institution. And how do we, how do we, you know, uh, connect, uh, you know, administration or hospital administration with, with specific budgets uh, you know, and different costs. So this is really important and, and trying to figure this out in the context of this disconnect. Remember, yes, you can cost cut and offer incremental improvement. We do that all the time, but the greater opportunity and the most financial reimbursement lies in strategical approaches to improve patient experience and achieve greater value. And this is where value comes into play. Um, and value-based purchasing, CJR, 3%, half of that is HCAP scores. So it's really important. And, and it kind of sucks because we try hard to help, and we are helping, and, uh, and then your budget goes whack, uh, out of control, and you get punished for it or you have to cut down. And the hospital, it may be doing uh, a lot of good for the hospital. Uh, so that's something to definitely uh, consider. So think first about where you are and where you want to go. So how do you get that message across? Um, how do you minimize opioid use in your institution? How could you improve? You've got to think about that because if you want to be a star, you've got to be on the opioid task force, opioid stewardship. There has to be a pharmacist representing, helping with order sets, helping create methods and ways to minimize opioids if possible, which also decrease adverse effects, right? Um, for pain relief in patients who can't tolerate oral meds, whether it's pre intra or post-op, or even if they're on, the, they're on the floors and they have, you know, dysphagia or they're having some sort of uh, speech and swallow issues, how could you improve uh, their pain regimen? Uh, think of it that way. Uh, for pain relief in patients with impaired renal function or risk of bleeding, how can you improve? Now, this even tied your hands even further. So now you have minimal amounts of non-opioid injectables, their NPO, and now they do have impaired renal function, which happens all the time, uh, especially in the post-operative setting. They may have AKI, uh, they may have CKD that's worsening, or they just may have an increased risk of bleeding. They may have uremia, they may have other underlying causes, thrombocytopenia, um, and you wouldn't want to go with an NSAID. Um, are you going to turn to an opioid? And that's where IVC acetaminophen plays a big role. 
uh, and helping be that, you know, that therapy to help minimize these opioids. So, again, you know, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? It's really important to try to get this message across. It's, it, it, you know, this, I think the genius behind this is, is, is trying to figure out how to get with either accountings or with, with, with finance or trying to figure out if a subgroup that you implement this regimen on or any regimen on is actually helping with reimbursement and, and uh, filling that void, that disconnect. So your role as a pharmacy to ensure uh, IV acetaminophen, how do you do this, right? So there's politics in every hospital. Uh, trust me, every hospital has their own politics. But you have to be strategic. So first of all, become knowledgeable about the appropriate use of the ferments. So to assist in formulary decision process. So, you know, you can't just go and say, I want everyone to get a Fermev. I mean, if you're someone on the floor, you've been here six days, you're watching your favorite show and you're tolerating PO, um, PO is the route to go. I mean, I, you know, cost savings, making sure you do the right thing for your institution, that's the route to go. So make sure you have that population that, that you know, this, is, this would work for or to start off with. Um, it's important. Uh, that you start that route because you want to have, you know, you want to have uh, uh, integrity. Uh, you want to be knowledgeable about what's going on, and you want to help the patients. Uh, also, identify an internal champion. So, yes, you can be involved. You can be the person if you're on the, you know, critical care team. If you're on the ID team, whatever team you're on, if you know the person who who, who works with that population who can help, you have to engage stakeholders and build consensus on how to encourage appropriate use in your institution. The champion could be a pharmacist, but it's good to have a pharmacist uh, and also have an anesthesiologist or a surgeon or a nurse or a pain team leader or any person invested in improving value and patient experience. And keep this in mind that sometimes it isn't the person with the biggest title. It's a personality. It's knowledge. It's someone who's in the field, possibly. It's someone who believes in it. So sometimes picking that champion is not purely based on title. You have to be able to get the message across, and you have to be able to to, to pick that sub, you know subpopulation you want to work on, uh, and, it, and it's super important. Um, so sometimes you got to put your ego to the side and allow someone else in your department to kind of take lead on this because some people probably either don't want to hear you or don't like you, who knows. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, monitor opioid usage in your institution through annual opioid data reviews. So data is everything. So if you're not running a project, a trial, uh, you know, uh, a case study, anything regarding uh, assessing your opioid use or evaluating trends, identifying areas for improvement in your hospital, then you have to, um, whether you're a pharmacist or a nurse, it could be a multidisciplinary team, um, we have to get together uh, and work on that if you're not already. A uh, joint commission was my institution. They had a big round table sit down at our main conference room with everyone, uh, administrators, clinical team, regarding what are you guys doing about the opioid crisis? What are you guys, you know, both for inpatient and outpatient? And also disseminate information in useful ways to support national standards, internal needs, public reporting. So, you know, utilize the Joint Commission, you know, utilize P&T to get some of this across, uh, publications, et cetera. So we're, we're unique, you know, and the reason why I liked, you know, and it's probably me being biased as a pharmacist, but we're uniquely qualified because we're like a gel. We're the balance between cost, availability, uh, meaning like what's the availability with purchasing, how much does it cost from an operational standpoint or workflow standpoint, and appropriate use from a clinical standpoint. And, and it's really important to be the gel uh, in the multidisciplinary team to kind of get that message across and help out with that. So these are some really cool um, – this is like my little guide to help you guys try to get something through PNT or to help your team. Um, and again, the biggest issue here is that disconnect with the reimbursement process um, with your uh, administrators and institution. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Um, I tried being as direct as I can. I tried hitting the big points. Um, I must say we're dealing with the COVID crisis here. Uh, we've just been creating ICUs, uh, and we're an orthopedic surgical hospital, but, and we take, we're taking the overflow, 
And, um, you know, as an antipyretic right now with all the NSAID theoretical issues going on with COVID-19, we've been utilizing uh, Affirmav and acetaminophen as a whole as being the number one antipyretic right now. Um, so, you know, I'm glad to have that aboard. And with all these huge um, opioid uh, drips given to these intubated patients and sedatives and, and, and um analgesics, it's, it's nice to try to wean them off by using as many agents as you can that are not opioids. Um, I thank everyone for having me. Thank you for listening. And um, if you have any questions, I'm here. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Soleil, for such an insightful presentation. We'll now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your dashboard. We'll try to get through as many questions as we have time for. The first question is from an audience member here who is asking, have you seen any benefits out of using Ofermev in reducing pain intensity? Yes. So, um, yeah, of course, we've seen it firsthand. And uh, the best people to kind of monitor that are your clinical team, whoever's on the unit. Um, yes, it does uh, 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 help with uh, pain intensity. We've seen scores go down. Uh, it, it's not going to go from an 8 to a 2. We, uh, you know, my, I, I usually see it go from a 6 to a 4, 6 to a 3. It's still substantial and beneficial. Um, it, I have. There is clinical benefit, absolutely. Perfect. And another audience member is asking more about the use cases of Ofermev, and they're asking, you know, where would you use it in an institution and in which population? So honestly, for us, the the first place I would suggest using it is for surgery, right? I mean, if you have a surgical institution, depending on what type of surgery, um, it's used in GI, it's used in orthopedics. Uh, what we like to do is we want to minimize opioids, and in the surgical process, usually patients are not their NPO. They they came in here fasting. Um, they come out of surgery the first few hours or even longer. They're not tolerating POs yet or they're asleep. Um, so we like to give it to them starting in the operating room and give it, you know, a few more doses as they come out um, because they're not awake or they're not tolerating PO yet or they haven't passed gas or, or whatever the case is. Um, those are the best cases to start with. Um, if you want to save money and you want to say let's transfer them after this once they leave the PACU or they tolerate PO, we'll switch them to the oral formulation, and that's fine. Um, we've also used it in patients, um, elderly patients, a lot of times that, that, that can't really tolerate uh, NSAIDs or ketorolac, because that's, that's another very common drug that we use as a non-opioid injectable. Um, if their renal function um, isn't so great, we definitely would go with the IV if we can. Uh, and patients on the floors who are, who are dealing with, they might be on the PO, acetaminophen, but they're very, it's very hard to, to handle um, or to control their pain. We would switch over to IV because, uh, you know, a lot of times in these settings, uh, the absorption is a little different based on your age, uh, sepsis, uh, fluid overload. There's a lot of pharmacokinetic changes when it comes to critical care as well, so in those situations as well. Perfect. Thank you for outlining some of those. I think that's helpful for our audience to hear. The next question is, what IV solution and volume is used for acetaminophen IV, and what is the rate of infusion? So usually uh, they say their infusions should be run over 15 minutes. So no matter what the dose is, we run it over 15 minutes. Um, uh, it's usually 10 mg per kg. Um, so one gram would be 100 ml, um, and we run that over 15 minutes. Uh, again, if you're 50 kilo, if you're 50 kilos or under, we like to put it in a syringe pump. I mean, in a syringe because the 50 cc syringe uh, to make sure that it's accurate when giving it, due to priming and losing of you know loss of drug. So anything for pediatrics or anyone who's frail or under 50 kilo, 50 kilos or under, we like to put it in a syringe and utilize a syringe pump. Perfect. Thank you for explaining that. The next question from an audience member is, is there a comparative advantage of using Ofermev in comparison to POAPAPAP excuse me, prior to surgery with multimodal analgesia post-surgery? 
Okay, so the problem with that is it's hard to detect. So if I give somebody PO prior to surgery who's been fasting and we're going to start them on opioids, let's say we did it a few hours before because that might hit home with a nice good dose of PO. But once they get into the operating room and they're being cut and it's a few hours in and you're going to give another dose, you can't give a PO at that point. Um, and then when they come out of surgery, they're still NPO. You can't give a PO at that point. If you'd like to trial giving some PO prior to surgery, that might be feasible to give it a shot. Um, but we carry it here, and we're not gonna, we didn't want to take that chance based on the pharmacokinetic nature of surgery and just um, your GI function and all these opioids and all these factors that play a role in absorption. Um, it's hard. Uh, listen, whether IV and PO are equivalent in a healthy gut is a whole different story. What we're talking about here are uh, an opioid crisis, minimizing opioids and, and utilizing multimodal analgesia. How do you do that if the patient's either unconscious in surgery or doesn't have an active gut? Um, and that's what we've been doing here. So, yeah, I understand, you know, everyone is trialing PO and they're saying, what if it's equal? What if it's equal? Well, it can't be equal if you can't swallow. So that's where the biggest population to utilize it is. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. The next question is about long-acting opioids, and the audience member says, can you expand on using long-acting opioids for acute pain as um, I believe they were recommended more for chronic pain? Yes. So uh, you're right. Uh, actually, uh, long-acting opioids are uh, discouraged for the most part. Nobody wants to have something, especially in the elderly, stay in your system for a long time, increase the sedation. You can't discharge the patients quicker. Sometimes you don't know how it's going to react. And you're right, usually we avoid that. We utilize it for chronic pain and not really for acute pain. We do have an acute pain team that's part of anesthesia that rounds. If a patient continues to utilize um, their PCA rescue, continue to utilize um, PRNs. There are some rare cases where we do start them on a long-acting agent. Got it. Thank you for that clarification. The next question is, what is the data comparing oral to intravenous acetaminophen in patients who can take it orally? So that's a really good question. There's, uh, it's controversial. Um, I can't go one way or the other. Um, if I can utilize PO uh, and a patient has a healthy gut, we're utilizing PO. Um, but again, I know the PO in h historically is effective. I know IV is effective. If I'm trying to minimize opioid use, I'm going to utilize the IV in patients where pharmacokinetically they may not be absorbing the PO and they are not tolerating PO. So I, 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 it's controversial. Um, some people say, well, you know what? No, they're the same. Or, you know, they're, they're just as good. There's no point to paying the money and getting IV. But then what do you do in these surgical procedures? What do you do in some of these patients that have an ileus or have a postoperative constipation or opioid-induced constipation that haven't had a bowel movement in three days? Are you continuing to give PO to save a dollar? And that's where we come into a conflict of, you know, ethically, what are we doing to save the money? And usually, healthcare professionals in general, pharmacists, nurses, you know, we like to, everyone wants to save money. And I'm all on board with that, but there, it, there are populations and times where you'd want to use the IV over the PO. Wonderful. Thank you again for that explanation. Um, another audience member would love to hear um, what has been your experience in using Ofremev in bilateral TKA procedures? That's, uh, we use it a lot. The bilateral TKAs um, are very painful. A uh, lot of blood loss, a lot of pain. So we do maximize it in those patients. We give a gram Q6 standing and, and then on the back end, if they need, you know, their PCA rescue or whatever they give, we almost give a blanket of acetaminophen in the back to try to minimize. And you know what? It, it has cut down. You know, it, it may not, you know, I'm not one of those guys that's going to sit here and make things up and, and, and um, 
you know, talk about points that might be controversial. But the truth is, uh, you know, we looked at our, our, our institution and we implemented a IVSC to Affirmav and we've been utilizing it. And again, there could be multivariable things that affect this, but our opioid um, uh, usage has gone down uh, pretty significantly by utilizing it more and more. So um, if you can utilize, again, an agent that's relatively safe, utilizing it for patients that are, you know, that need it, an IV, that need an IV formulation, are we just giving diluted pushes or fentanyl? Are we giving ketamine? Are we doing all that because we want to save money? Because I guarantee you that the moment this, if they came out tomorrow and said that this vial is five cents, everyone's going to utilize it. And I will make a bet on that. So the same people that are fighting it for, and I get it because we want to save money, but the same people fighting it for specific patient populations that may need it will be the same people that order it when it's cheaper. And I think it's a money issue, but at the end of the day, patient satisfaction, like we said, HCAP scores, things of that nature, any way we can minimize opioids and get these patients out of here quicker and safer is, is pertinent. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Soleil, you have given us so many great insights today. Before we end the presentation, I just wanted to turn the floor back over to you. Are there any final thoughts that you would like to share? Uh, I just, uh, I'd like to say that, you know, um, I think we're dealing with a hard time in the country. I think that everyone just needs to stick together. Uh, everyone needs to work together. Uh, everyone's strengths needs to come out. Uh, and it doesn't matter what state you're in. You can always call someone else in another state in your profession to help. Uh, get on conference calls. Uh, call some associations. Uh, Zoom. Do whatever you have to do. We're all trying to help each other get through this. Uh, whether it's the pain crisis or the coronavirus 19 or whatever it is, we're going to get through this. Um, and it's pretty difficult, uh, but we're going to get through it. Yes, I think those are great words to end on. So, Dr. Sule, thank you again so much for such a great presentation. And thank you to Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals for sponsoring today's webinar. Please enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Thank you for having me.